years, I looked after my elderly aunt in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. And one of the first things I did when she needed help was to call the local area agency and to work with them on trying to get her support. And so I know firsthand um, the challenges. You're so glad to be serving them and helping them and taking care of them, but it is also a lot of challenge. So please um, connect with our area agency on aging and with um, the one if, it's, if you have someone across the nation. Please um, go back and look at some of the resource tables, get some more information. And um, I think today is going to be a great day. I'm so glad you're all here. And, uh, you know, just get all that you can out of today's event. So thank you. that she walked across the room and she just didn't even want to just raise her hand. This was a doozy of a question. So I put the mic in front of her. She asked the question. The representative of the area agency on aging was there. We were about half an hour into the morning session and the area agency on aging care coordinator slammed the, hand the table and said, I've been waiting a half an hour for someone to ask that question. And this character floated back to her seat <laughs> on means of air. The Family Caregiver Support Program started about 12 years ago um, when folks finally realized the assistance that caregivers need. Um, we offer our 24-hour senior helpline to answer any questions that you may have in English and Spanish. We can send the care manager to your home to do an assessment in home at no cost of both the care receiver and the caregiver to see how you're doing. We offer support groups countywide. They're in English and Spanish. Some are disease specific um, in coordination with the Alzheimer's Association, local Parkinson's disease entity. Um, we also have groups online and also an LGBT caregiver group. We offer caregiver trainings throughout the year as well, dealing on things like taking care of yourself during the holidays, how to communicate with your loved one's medical provider, um, and uh, Arizona long-term care, for example. Having that conversation with the other members, whether they live locally or long distance, explaining the expenses that's coming into the home, the expenses going out of the home, and what is it going to continue to cost this family to care for mom in this home? I need to clean my house, and I can't do it when he's around because I get, I get so mad that I see him just sitting there. You know, he can't help it, but <laughs> for me, I just get really angry about that. And is there the adult daycare, would they take him? <laughs> Will they take them now? You know, that's exactly what we're there for. We're, whatever the need is, you know, if the need happens to be respite, or if it happens to be a, a quality day for the person that comes, or medical monitoring, or the services of our social workers, or just to hang out with people and laugh and see other people during the course of the day like we all did all our lives, that's, uh, that's, that's absolutely why he should come to the home take care. If you're dealing with someone who has Alzheimer's disease or related dementia, there are more than 60,000 people who were diagnosed with that disease just in Maricopa County. And that's people who were diagnosed. So you're not alone. There are a lot of people here to support you. And I'm here to talk about the programs and services that we offer absolutely free to every one of you. from the office of the governor, Janice K. Brewer. Whereas each year, the month of November is set aside to pay tribute to Arizona's family caregivers by recognizing the value of the service they provide. And whereas 
family caregivers are a vital resource in Arizona, providing over $9 billion per year in unpaid care to loved ones across the lifespan. Now, therefore, I, Janice K. Brewer, Office of Governor of the State of Arizona, do hereby proclaim November 2014 as Arizona Family Caregivers Month. That I'm here for the same reason many of you are here. I, I was a family caregiver myself. I cared for both of my parents, uh, including my mother, until she died in 2005. Uh, as part of that process, I ended up, as many as we've heard uh, some stories today, I ended up having to quit my job. Uh, I have seven sisters. Uh, four of them were nurses at one time, and my mom picked me to be the family caregiver. So. Uh, <laughs> talk right now about uh, Kate Broby McGee, who is a wonderful example of one of our best state representatives. Her door is open to us, she listens so well to us, and she understands, and I'd like to invite her up here to be able to present to her fearless caregiver. I've always believed as a legislator that our image, who we are, what we are as a state, is exemplified in how we deal with our most vulnerable populations, our children, our elderly, our disabled, and it is important to policymakers to understand the depth and breadth of the network of at-home caregivers who are out there, who are providing an optimal setting for their family member under sometimes just extremely difficult circumstances. And to the extent that that happens and our legislators don't know about it, they don't think it's a problem. Representative Heather Carter represents District 15, always available to meet with constituents, caregivers, and members of the ACC, that's the Arizona Caregiver Coalition, she has proven to be one of our champions and deserving, very deserving of this national award. I'm asking you individually, each one of you, to not only reach out to your personal elected representatives in the state legislature, but to every elected official, official in the state legislature. We are bringing an entire new cadre of elected officials down to the Capitol this year. Many of them may have no idea about this issue, just as my friend Kate was explaining. And it is our job, mine with yours, with Representative Kate Brophy McGee, to educate people on what's going on out in the community and how those elected officials can best serve their constituency. seven years, so that's a lot of time that can happen in seven years, and that's just the average. If we can step in and provide a way for them to still communicate, they're less likely to withdraw. When they talk on the captioned telephone, they can hear and talk just like regular. They can turn up the volume. It has a 40 decibel gain in amplification, so they can turn it up very loudly. But they can also read everything that they're hearing. Well, it costs nothing. So in 1990, we all started to get to pay a small tax on our phone bills. Um, the FCC regulates this fund, and the, the law was written that all of the major phone providers were um, issued a tax to be able to provide this to their customers, and the phone providers are so generous that they pass it on to every single last one of us. Merle, our volunteer, said it's an honor to help this caregiver by grocery shopping for, for her mom. That way, on the weekend, after she's worked all week, after she's been taking care of her own kids, when she goes to visit her mom, she's not out running in here. She's able to sit by her and hold her hand and have some good quality interaction. We want to help grandparents also by um, being that support, as I mentioned, through our support groups or sharing rooms. And we find that those are really helpful. 
Um, as many of you know here, being caregivers, this is where you're going to connect with others who are in similar situations. This is where you're going to get that positive feedback. This is where you're going to find out about networking and what resources are available to you.